Come on, let's go. Come on now. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, first of all, we are going to pray. Then I'm going to read my very short text. Last time it was like seven verses. Tonight everybody is one. Okay, so if you don't mind, we're all standing. We can bow our heads. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the rain, God. Because the rain reminds us, God, that you know what? You're here regardless, during the sunshine or the storms. God, tonight, I humbly thank you for being here in this pulpit. That your servant, who is away, God, getting a well-needed rest, God, has left this service into my hands tonight, actually into your hands through me. So tonight, I humbly thank you, God, for the word that you have downloaded in my spirit, that we may learn from it, God, that it may encourage someone, God, who may feel that they are on the outskirts, but, God, you don't know what is within them. So, dear God, tonight, I thank you with everything, God, that I have to offer. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. You all ready? Yes. Okay, so we're all standing. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. We're taking this from Hebrews 11:31. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had been received by the spies. May God add a blessing to the reading of this holy word, and you may not sit down. <laughs> not again. No, 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 no. Last time it was a high five. This time we're going to give a round of applause because let me tell you, last week Christians took a bashing. The church took a bashing, so they thought it's time to give a little, you know, a little encouragement. Come on. Let's go. We just need some encouragement. We need some encouragement. Because I'm telling you, the all to get us, it ain't going to work. And we're going to praise and worship our way through this one. So we're going to let them know. We're going to praise and worship our way through this one. All right, you may take your seats if you want. If not, you can remain standing. It's up to you. <laughs> Tonight, I'd like to thank everyone who came out. I would like to thank my dear, sweet, loving husband, Popeye. Stand up, Stuart. Stand up, honey. Jordan is away on a ski trip, so it has been a honeymoon. <laughs> My mother's there, so I can't say too much. <laughs> Mom, I love you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay, I have two quick stories to tell before I get into my message. The first one, it was from a friend of ours who actually saw me, my presentation on SWIM, and I first did it about Millie Vanilli, and he's the type of guy that you would look in the street and maybe pass on by or think that he's talking just absolutely nothing. But this is the conversation. I saw you on TV. I said, really? Hey, I saw you and your twin. I said, well, Janice, yeah. No, I saw a girl who looked just like you. <laughs> I said, oh, you, oh, you saw the presentation? He said, yes. I said, so what did you think of it? He says, well, let me tell you what I thought of it. And this was a guy who you thought would not look at swim. He says, I didn't turn it off. Oh, I said, oh. <laughs> he said, I understood everything you were talking about. And I even remember the group. I said, you do? He said, yes. I'm like, I'm oh, excited. I said, listen, don't worry about the next time anybody speaks, but the doors are always open for you. Come in as you are. We're not going to do, we're not going to turn you away. We will accept you. So just come on in. He's not here tonight. However, I saw him again on Monday. And he says, when are you speaking next? I said, Wednesday. He says, what are you speaking about? I said, well, I'm going to speak about um, Rahab the harlot. He says, what you going to say about her? <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to talk about um, how she was one way, but turned out to be another way. He's like, yeah, and I'm not going to repeat the words he said, because I cannot. But he got a little spicy, because he said in his life, people always perceive him to be one way, and they need to understand and get to know him. I said, all right, thank you, God, for your mercy and your confirmation. So that was him, and I, it was hilarious. But this is a story, this account that I'm going to tell you now, it really ties in more with what I'm going to talk about. In December, I was catching the bus home, and I just couldn't wait to get him. It was just after Christmas, 
everybody was in a good mood. Jesus was still popular, you know, all that. And everybody was on the bus. The bus went to up two stops. Then someone caught the bus. Instantly, you just felt a wave of disgust go on the bus. And all this person did was catch the bus. Now, this person's got issues. So I joined him. I was like, oh, gosh, no. Why, Lord, why? I just want to get home. No drama. So what happened? All you see, the hands started to fill. The eyes started to go left and right. <sighs> Gracious, Lord, this person is no, what's not what no. Then I caught the eyes of another passenger. And I was about to join in the corporate eye rule. <laughs> but the Lord said to me right then, stop. They're one of mine. I'm like, okay. Then this verse came to my mind. Matthew 7, 5. Anybody know it? Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. Why God had to go there, I just don't know. I didn't think that applied to me, but apparently it did because it's one of his children, regardless of where they are now in their life. So we also must remember, especially during this time where the church is, Matthew 22, 37, 40, and Jesus said unto them, and if you know this, feel free to join me. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, not just a few, all of them. I'm like, okay, God. Then he was like, you know what? Go home and meditate on Rahab. I said, okay, Sister Rahab. So tonight's message is entitled, Sex and the City. Now, you know when you bring up that word sex, a little lot of minds go all over the place, but we're just going to keep it on Rahab tonight and what she did. This title is from an HBO series, Sex in the City, about four women who lived in New York. Charlotte, Miranda, um, Carrie, and Samantha. We're not talking about them tonight. We're going to talk about another girl who lived in another city. Her name was Rahab. And we're going to see how she made out with the following three points her lifestyle, her life-changing lesson, and her legacy. Point number one, her lifestyle. Now, the mere mention of Rahab's name is scandalous. Rahab, the prostitute, the heathen, the hooker, common, cold girl, a woman of ill repute, the harlot, However, there are more words that can be used to describe her. How about daughter, sister, businesswoman? And because she was in that business, how about COO, CEO, CFO? But my favorite, how about smart? She was smart. She was no one's fool. Ra, in her name, is the name of an Egyptian goddess. She was a pagan worshiper and didn't believe in our God. Further research has that her meaning was also trustworthy, vast, and proud. She had lots of Matthew 7, 5 going on. She was a woman from the wrong side of the tracks. Back of town, through town, wrong town, all over the place. Now, she lived in the city of Jericho, and this was a bustling and sometime rowdy city. It is said to have been surrounded by an inner wall and an outer wall. Now, the more well-to-do, they lived in the inner wall. I guess they must have felt more protected inside the inner wall. But the poor and the disreputable lived on the outer compound between the wall. And Rahab's house was right on the outer wall. So everybody saw what was going on in her house. She entertained, and my favorite word that I found while research was, she comforted man. Hmm, she gave him comfort, all right. Yes, public knowledge of an intimate act, and everybody knew about it. We can all judge and say, hmm, how could she do that? But realistically, sometimes when you push to the brink, you'll do anything. So the Bible never says how and why and 
she got into this, we don't know. We just know that she was a prostitute. Now, she did entertain many men. Some were travelers and told stories about how the Israelites, a generation ago, God delivered them out of slavery from Egypt, was with them going through the desert, was chased and pursued by an Egyptian army, crossed the parted Red Sea, and it closed on the Israelite army that was pursuing them after the Israelites were in safety. And now they're <laughs> in Canaan. Well, how'd that happen? Her fear of the Israelites awakened, and I believe somewhere in her also awakened her faith in God because they were out there, all these people. She didn't know what was going on. I found it interesting getting ready for this lesson that one article said that Rahab only not had her home, but she was an innkeeper. So it was a brothel, it was her home, and it was an inn. Okay. But she also had a job of raising and buying flax because she made linen. And she took it to the roof to dry one day. Our God is so awesome. He just knows how to play that chess. He moves people around, and you don't know why. You just move. So point number two, her life lesson. Rahab was not only one to have heard about the Israelites. The whole city heard about them. But seemed that she was the only one, or I don't know if any more, but who abandoned her pagan faith and taken up the faith of God not just to fear Israelites, but she also started to fear God. There are many pagan gods, but she didn't have an understanding of how they work. She now was starting to fear something that she didn't know about. Joshua, the Israelite leader, had sent two spies into Jericho to scout out and gauge the city's defenses. The two spies ended up at the inn. Keeping in mind that people saw who went in and out of her home, and the word got out. She knew these men were different. They weren't customers. They didn't want to be comforted. They had something else in mind. They had a mission. When the king of Jericho heard about the spies that entered the city, he sent the soldiers to Rahab's home immediately to investigate and arrest the spies. Word got back to her. So what she did was she took the spies to the roof of her house, hid them under her flax that she had drying. So when the soldiers did come, knocked on her door, she entered, you know, hi, how you doing? You seen some spies? Yeah, I did, you know. But I don't know who they were. I don't know where they went. They went that way. And they left just before the gate closed in the city. So you need to go somewhere and find them because I don't know where they are. They believed her. She sent them on a wild goose chase. She lied. She was a trustworthy prostitute. And those gentlemen from the army, I'm sure, could have been customers who, mind you, could have given her some secrets that she was keeping for them, too. We didn't know that. Be careful. Now, the king's soldiers left, and she went back up to the rooftop and told them, and this is from Joshua 2, 9 to 11, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, what you did to the kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Shion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. Please keep in mind that if she was found to have hidden the spies, she would have been killed. The spies would have been killed, and they probably would have killed her family. Since she knew that something was up, she made an oath, a covenant to them. Like I said, she was, she was so smart. She, mm -mm, she, she held them. That they were to protect her family. Joshua 2, 12 to 14 says, Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. Yet ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all they have and deliver our home from death. And the men answered her, 
our life for yours. If ye utter not this our business, mm -hmm. and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we deal kindly and truly with thee. In other words, I'm looking for a promise. I saved you, you saved me, and all my family along with it. Swear it to God. Their response to her was, yeah, we can save you. As long as you don't open your mouth and tell anybody. So folks, if God's giving you a message and you feel that you have to tell everybody, just keep it quiet. Because sometimes he can't work with a whole lot of uttering going on. So if we want the church to go and pass has been given something and she doesn't come out and tell anybody, don't get upset. You'll find out sooner or later. So just, just hang on. You know, keep it quiet. Okay, so she let them off the roof using a scarlet cord. And they told her to keep the cord hanging in her window as long as her family are all gathered in her house and the cord is there, you will be saved when the city is being invaded. If any of her family was outside of the home, outside of the protection, they'll be on their own. They kept their promise. The city was invaded. The city walls came crashing down on the inhabitants, and the Israelites burned the city. But her house, the whorehouse, didn't crumble because of her faith and her obedience. The ghetto was saved. <laughs> so if we think that just because we're rich and we live in a nice neighborhood that we're not going to be touched, don't get it twisted. You never know who's in your house. Joshua 6, 22, 25. But Joshua had said unto the men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as ye swore unto her. The young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father and her mother and her brethren and all she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household, and all that she had and dwelleth in Israel, even unto this day, because she hid the messengers, which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. She responded to God and helped with the capture. Point number three, her legacy. And this is the part that I really, really enjoy. Rahab abandoned her pagan life. She just didn't leave it. She abandoned it and was adopted into the Israelite family. Over time, she learned the laws of God and completely changed her life. Her past was no more. She ended up marrying Salmon, whose name means peaceable, perfect, he that rewards, and who coincidentally was one of the spies that she hid. And he was a prominent man in the tribe of Judah. She traded up. She traded up, family. She didn't stay down. She was blessed. She became the mother to Boaz, who married Ruth. And their son, Obed, would become the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David. From David would descend the savior of all mankind, Jesus Christ, who was himself and still is peaceable, perfect. And he is from the one who rewards. Have we not learned from Rahab and others like her? Look what God had in her all the time. She had a hidden royal bloodline in her. But I do have a question. Let's look at Bermuda 2016. This message is not only for women, but it's for mankind. Now just think about it. How many times have we been prostituted as a people, community, country, for money and prestige? People prostituting the word of God for personal gain and validation of sin, whatever it may be. How many times have we been visited, and we're going to register because something's happening next year. How many times have we been visited at our home with someone telling you one thing 
and turning around and doing something that they didn't promise to do. What's under their flags? What's under their flags? Is this sex in the city? Mm -hmm. Have we cut the scarlet cord? Or do we as Christians constantly pray for the coverage of the blood of Jesus? Are we constantly reading the Bible so that we can share the news of Jesus Christ to others in hopes that they would come to him and confess their sins? Are we willing to keep the standard of holiness that God wants from us? God made a faithless harlot the descendant of his son Jesus. Notwithstanding that Jesus himself made himself known to the harlots, the demon-possessed, the murderers, the thieves, the liars, and some may call him riffraff, the remnant, and they turned their lives around. And he also made himself known to you and to me. Are we carrying a Rahab spirit? Or are we enjoying sex in the city without noticing the scarlet cord? So as I close tonight with this one line, I would like to say, let's not cut the cord. I would like to thank you for your attention tonight. <laughs>